Billy Liar by Keith Waterhouse, Chapter 5. In the cold, sunny on a Saturday afternoon, St. Bottle's Passage was just about bearable. It was alive with fat men in dark suits puffing and blowing over folded dress and papers and chucking clean empty packets of twenty down on the uneven paving stones. Men in raincoats came and went in the vicinity of the shady chemists, and a swaying red-faced group continued an argument outside the pub, while them saying the same sentence over and over again, like a blocked gramophone. It seems to be the same group every Saturday, having the same argument. Have you realised, I said to the man of the day, puff, puff, that your blunt Yorkshire individuals are in fact interchangeable, like spare wheels on a mass-produced car? At the end of the passage by Market Street, there was even a violinist with his hat on the floor playing pennies from heaven. Shadrach and Duxbury's was the only shop with the blinds down. But the door was open and the bell rang quietly when I went in. The office was cold and dusty now, and looking more like a funeral parlour than usual, with old blind filtering a green, dead light over the empty desks. I stood hesitating. Gaping dozily at the washed looking photograph of Councillor Duxbury, doffing his bowl in front of a horse ridden hearse. It was very quiet. I had a quick happy notion that he had abandoned the office forever. Oh, drop dead in their own coffins or something. But then I saw the thin red glow of the convector heater shining in the Shadrach store. I went over reluctantly and knocked. He was not there. It was probable that he was out on Market Street selling a Morris thousand to some fruit or other. Shadrach had never quite abandoned his previous trade. I sauntered over to my desk and sat down heavily, feeling happier because Shadrach was not there. It was, after all, not beyond the range of possibility that he'd been run over by a bus. I lit one of my cigarettes and earnestly opened the drawer of my desk. I stared vacantly into it for a moment, then made a decision. My desk drawer was a sort of town branch of the guilt chest. There were a few documents in it that did not even cause a passing spasm of anxiety. I began briskly to sort through them, tearing up the unposted funeral accounts first, then the obscene verses about Councillor Duxbury, and the rough notes for a long love letter I had once written to the witch, daringly mentioning her breasts by name. There were about eight first pages of the two schools at Grimminster. I stacked them together tore them through the middle and dropped them in the waste paper basket. There seemed to be whole sheaves of quarto and nothing written on them but my name in a variety of handwriting styles. I threw those away too. There was a fragrant dialogue entitled Burglar Scene that I'd once thought just right for Danny Boone. If a father's rod it'll be curtains for you. Or by it's a curtain rod of course. I'm a very respectable man you know, a very respectable man. My wife and I own uh, the iron and steel business. She does the iron and I'll do the stealing. I put this in my pocket, together with the beginnings of a letter I tried to write to Danny Boo. At the back of the drawer there was an old, yellowing piece of full scap, on which I tried to list all the things that were in me at the time. The idea was that I should take each item as it ceased to be an anxiety, or when I had finished there'd be nothing left to worry me anymore. I looked at the list again apprehensively. There was nothing on that long list I could honestly cross off and forget about. I made a decision and ripped the piece of paper into four, dropping the pieces into the waste paper basket. There was nothing left in the desk except a long ink stain, ink stain, a stubs of pencil and the word Liz, which I had blocked in with careful crayon. I got up and tried to open Stamp's desk but it was locked. I paced around the office whistling through my teeth. One of the habits I was going to get out of was the sort of vocal equivalent of the nervous grimace, an ever-expanding repertoire of odd noises and sound effects that I'd run through in time of tension. Alone in my bedroom, seeking refuge in a telephone box, or walking purposefully, purposely, purposely home along Clog Iron Lake at night. I would begin to talk to myself, the words degenerating first into senseless, ape-like sounds, and then into barnyard imitations, increasing in absurdity, until I was completely incoherent, 
Bit of fun, I switched back into human speech with a kind of thought stream monologue on whatever problem was uppermost in my mind at the time. I did this now, dropping my cigarette end into Stamp's inkwell. London is a big place, Mr. Shadrach, I began mumbling to myself. A man can lose himself in London. You know that. Lose himself. But who? Who's himself? Lose himself. Himself. Him. 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 Himself. Ah, him. Ourself. Wandering about the office, I started on the odd sounds and imitations of animals. Hi, 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 Taking in a fragment, fragment of one of the routines I went through with Arthur from time to time. And now what Sir Winston Churchill might have said, Never in the field of human conflict. And this is the voice of Mal. We a woolly fish are saying, ma 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 grump grump What a beautiful little pig. Hey, say, what a beautiful little pig. I began to repeat this sentence, a variety of tones, stresses and dialogues, ranging from rapid Mickey Mouse squeak to the bass draw and going to all the joicy and variations. What a beautiful little pig. What a beautiful little pig. I was standing in the open door of Shadrach's office. The room was beginning to echo with my voice. I stopped for a moment and toyed with the idea of going in and having a quick run through Shadrach's desk. But my ankles tingled at the thought. I had a short flash of number two thinking, trapped in Shadrach's swivel chair, with the drawer of his desk jammed open. For relief, I turned back to my verbal doodling and began to call his name. Mr. Shadrach! Mr. Shadrach! Ha, Mr. Shadrach! Me, he, he, Mr. Shadrach! 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 Each time I called the rack sound, bounced off his streamlined convector stove. Shad a rack! Shad a rack! Shad a Shad 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 a rack! Holy shudders! I was just dropped drawing breath the second run when Shadrach, who had undoubtedly been listening for the past ten minutes, came into the office through the door that led down to the lavatory. I stuck a finger in my throat and began going, Ah, <coughs> ah, <coughs> <coughs> trying to falsify his memory of what he had heard. My feel re- first real thought was one of relief that I'd not been going through his desk. My second was to turn on him with the Ambrosium repeater gun. Rather like a machine gun, which I kept permanently mound for such occasions as this. Oh, it's you, is it? said Shadrach, but without any indication that his words explained or excused the din I had been making. Had he heard everything, or had he just come up from downstairs? Even downstairs he could not have failed to hear. Four moves flashed through my mind like a drowning man's life story. One pretend was singing. Do pretend not to see him and continue making a sound like singing. Three, pretend rehearsing play. And yet, lady Alice, even pigs have feelings. Four, on the number one level, I'm glad you heard that, Shadrach. I've been wanting to you to hear my views for a long time. Hope uh, my singer didn't put you off, I said. Curious thing you were making, said Shadrach. You better come into the office. I followed him into his private sanctum, humming in an embarrassed way. Shadrach's office was furnished in what he imagined to be an American executive style, in so far as he could afford it. <laughs> he had a metal desk completely free of everything except a black ebony ruler, an unacceptable object to me ever since he had discovered me. You are, I think, discovered me, conducting with it from a record of Abide With Me, which he kept on the record player. Another item of luxury. I turned the ambrosium repeater gun on him again for good measure. On a little coffee bar sort of table, there were plans and drawings of the glass fibre coffin he was working on, and a yellow pad in which we doodling ideas for a streamlined hearse. Beyond this, a couple of grey contemporary chairs, the first ever seen in Stradorton, and on the wall, box print of one of those Chinese horses. Come in, sit down, make your self at home, said Shepard. He smiled with his bad teeth and produced from his blazer pocket a match-sized model made out of perspex. I was wedge-shaped coffee. You know, by the time we're burying you, you'll be going off on one of these. You know that? Really? I said, 
trying to decide interested. I'm not fooled by his manner. The well-known friendly word, the boss relaxing on his Saturday afternoon off. I perched on one of the grey chairs and cleared my throat. <coughs> shut, shut. <coughs> you see, people don't realise it's all clean lines nowadays. All these frills and fancies are going out, it's all... Hmm... That's sad. Same as a tell Councillor Duxbury, you've got to move the times. It's no use living in one style and dying in another. It's anarchism. Anachronism. I said before I could stop myself. Yes, well, said Shadrach, turning abruptly to the olive green filing cabinet and took out a manila file. He held it up and tapped it. Anyway, that's my worry. Suppose you want to talk to me about this letter of yours, do you? I had an absurd feeling of importance. I should have written the letter, and then you should have put it in a file. He put the file open on the desk, and I saw there were several other pieces of paper under my letter of resignation. I fell to wondering this some kind of personal dossier, filled with reports and stamp in the witch and the secret spidery mumblings of Councillor Duxbury. Shadwright perched on the desk, adjusting his tapered slacks and shooting his cuffs. So you're thinking of leaving us, hey? Is that it? Yes, well, I was thinking, now this opportunity's come up. I trotted out a wretched, shambling imitation of the speech I had prepared. Shadwright picked up my letter and examined it. I tried to see what the next pair on the file was. It was one of his yellow memo sheets with a lot of his writing on it. He frowned over the letter as though he could not read. No, I succeeded in obtaining a post with Mr. Danny. Boom! He quoted and I had an idea he was going to go through the letter point by point, getting me to expand. Now, that's the chap who was on the telly the night, isn't it? That's right, I said, <laughs> an encouraging voice. Bye bye, clever fellow. And just so you're going to work for him. Yes, well, you like some of my material, I sent him in. That's your ambition, is it? Script writing. It was the eager question of off-duty Saturday afternoon. Oh yes, I always have been, I said, <laughs> beginning to relax and sit back in the chair. And of course, there's quite a lot of money if you go about it the right way. You get paid by the joke then, or what? Or do you get a salary coming in each week? Well, it's uh, very, very difficult to say, I said. I've noticed before, I often tended to start imitating the person I was talking to. Uh, but Shadrach had lost interest. While I was scrabbling away trying to think of something to tell him, he began mumbling, murmuring. Yeah. Yeah. Absent mindedly and shuffling the papers in his file. His expression changed to a business one. He got up off the desk and stood behind his chair, putting his full weight on it and swiveling it from side to side. Yes, yeah, so for this letter, Shadrach began. And it was obvious they were getting down to the serious business. I looked up intelligently. Now, you don't need me to tell you it's a very, very unsatisfactory letter like this, now do you? I mumbled trying to get some action into my voice. Oh, sorry to hear that. Very unsatisfactory. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it's unprofessional, for sure. Very, very unprofessional. Shadrach had had a thing about un the undertaking business being a profession. I cleared my throat and said, Well, I suppose I've got to leave sometime. Yes, we realise that. We all realise that. Don't doubt it. Nobody wants to stand in your way. Don't think that. And I wish you the bah, bah, best of luck. But it's felt that you might have gone about it in a satisfactory manner. Oh, well, uh, in uh, what way? <laughs> It sounded like something out of the dramatics when I said it. Well, we were hoping, we were hoping that you'd try and get one or two things cleared up before you took a step like this. And I see a chill. A familiar enough visitor for now sees me somewhere under the heart. I cleared my throat again and apparently... <coughs> what? You see... I don't mind telling you that we were very, very disappointed you've not been to see us before this. I mean, before you wrote this letter. I mean, don't think I want to make things awkward for you. Far from it. But it has been felt you owe us one or two 
the full explanations. It was difficult not to look as I understood what he was talking about. I said, trying to keep up the equal part of his voice a few moments before. Well, I know my work probably hasn't been up to uh, as good as it might have been. I mean, that's one reason why I think I ought to leave. Uh, it's not a question of work, said Shadrach. It's not a question of work at all. It's just a question of what you propose to do about one or two things. He looked at me levelly, trying to gauge how much of the message was coming across. And then he said almost gently, You see, there's those calendars to be explained for one thing. I mean, we've never had any satisfactory explanation about that. No, have we? I stayed back at him, licking my lips. It was no surprise to, to me that Shadrach actually knew about the calendars. He was bound to suspect, if not know. I'd just been hoping that the natural delicacy or some kind of feeling of hopelessness would have prevented him from bringing the subject up. There were many things, in fact, on which I leaned heavily on the reluctant, brooding tact that was Shadrach's speciality. I decided that my best policy was to say nothing, and indeed, I had nothing to say. I mean, they cost a lot of money to produce a lot of money. You can't understand what you did with them. I felt bound to make some sort of effort. Well, there was a bit of a misunderstanding. I began a story about a fire at the post office beginning to cobble itself together in my mind. It wasn't a misunderstanding, it's just that two or three hundred calendars didn't get posted, to my knowledge. I mean, I know you want to leave. I think it's the best thing you could do. I think you're taking a very wise step. We all realise that, but you see, we've got to get this cleared up and implemented. No, I didn't know, and neither did he, what he meant by implemented. Shadrach had a habit of holding words and dropping them into a sentence when they got too heavy for him. It was obvious now he was going to go on and on about the calendars, probably for half the afternoon, simply because he'd never studied the art of changing the subject. I decided that I was supposed to make some constructive suggestion. Well, of course, if it's a question of paying for them... Ah, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait just one little minute, it's not as easy as that, it's not as easy as that. You see, there's the goodwill to consider, what about the goodwill? Those calendars were for goodwill, we can't understand why you didn't send them out, I mean, that's what they were there for, I mean, we don't buy calendars so you can just go out and chuck them on the fire, you know, that's not what we're in business for. He's getting warmed up now. He'd stopped fiddling about with his chair and was sitting down, leaning forward over the desk, messing about with the other ruler. His eyes glistening. No, that won't do at all. I'm afraid you don't seem to appreciate a fair, fair serious business. And then, of course, there's this other matter. What uh, other matter? I said dully. I think you know, uh, well, what matter? It's no good sitting there saying, what matter? There's this matter of the nameplates, isn't there? Here, yeah, I have no advantage at all. For the first time, my mouth sagged. I had suspected, when I considered the thing seriously, that Shadrach knew about my calendars. I felt that he knew something about the irregularities of the postage book, a subject I'd surprised had not been ventilated earlier in the conversation. I was fairly sure he knew about the offensive imitations of Councillor Duxbury, but was too inarticulate to mention them. But I would have sworn, willingly, that he knew nothing about the nameplates. In a way, the nameplates were just as serious as the calendars, if not more so. There were two of them, and I'd hidden them in the box of shrouds down in the stockroom. The whole thing had happened during Shadrach's holiday in the summer. I'd been supposed to order a coffin nameplate for the funeral of a preacher who had dropped dead in the aisle at Bridal Street Methodist Church. By mistake, thinking I was something else, I put the letters R.I.P. on the engraver's instructions, with the result that they turned out what was in effect a Catholic nameplate for a Methodist body. I had got the thing hurriedly remade, but too late for the funeral. By a miracle, Neither Councillor Duxbury nor the relatives had noticed it was missing and the Methodist minister had been buried in an unidentified coffin. 
It has nothing to do with any plates but I them. And I'd often worried about them, sometimes going into the theological aspects of the affair and wondering if I committed anything to do with uh, the unforgivable sin. I would have sworn that Shadrach knew nothing about it. You see, that's another matter we've got to get cleared up. I don't see how you can leave without getting that cleared up. You do not make it evident whether or not he knew where the nameplates were. Perhaps he knew only that the body had been buried without a nameplate. I'd lived in fear for some time of an exhumation either. I decided to sneak downstairs when he let me go and stuff the nameplates under my pullover. But I can only say I'm sorry if there's been any inconvenience, I said. Inconvenience. Inconvenience. <laughs> he gave a short snort and ended one of his caves of rhetoric. It's not a question of inconvenience, it's a question of what you propose to do about it. Supposing the lotus are found, what sort of fool do you think I'd have looked then? Supposing Council of Duxbury had found out. I hope the slightly I wrote that he was shielded me from Council of Duxbury. You see, I'm very much afraid that you've been spending too much time out in the fool. You seem to think you're on the music calls, not in the funeral furnishings. I was beginning to be possessed by an inward, impotent rage. What did he mean want me to do? I told him my sins, pay for another year as a penal servitude, pay for the calendars and the name plates, get the good will back. Shadrach looked at the yellow paper in his file where I was quite ready to believe he had a list of my misdemeanors scribbled down like a charge sheet. I expected to tick them off and start each charge with, but he did unlawfully. Yes, there's been too much acting before in this office, we'll have to get some of the system. You see, then there's these verses. You never wrote those out now, did you? Shadrach had once caught Arthur and me writing songs in the firm's time, and he set us to work making up little verses for the In Memoriam column in the Echo, a chore he'd handled for the bereaved on a commission basis. The nearest we'd got to the job was an obscene poem about Councillor Duxbury and a couple of lines about Josiah Alroyd in the window. Josiah Alroyd has gone to join his maker. Come inside and join Josiah Alroyd. <laughs> Shadrach knew about them both, and I was relieved he was getting on to the minor misdemeanours, but I knew that even those could keep him talking for hours. Then there's the office paper you've been using for your bits and pieces, I mean, it all cost money as well. I'll pay for it. It's not a question of paying for it. In the outer office, the telephone began to ring. Shadrach picked up his extension and found it was not connected. It was my responsibility to see that it was. Last thing on Saturday morning. He shot me a look of exasperation and he rose to his feet. Anyway, under the circumstances I have to tell you, I have to tell you, Fisher, that under no circumstances can we accept your resignation at the moment, not at the moment, not until we've got this straightened out. We may even have to take some kind of legal action, I don't know. He strode out of his office and went over to the switchboard. Shadow can took spree. I got up and stood in the doorway, running over the bit about legal action and testing it for strength. Shadrach began talking about some morning to talking to some morning wine from his soupy funeral voice. I just stood there. He put his hand over the mouthpiece and said, "Well, we'll talk about this another time." I walked unsteadily out of the door, twisted the door handle for a moment, and walked out into some buttholes passage. For the first time since breakfast. I felt my elusive yawn coming on, and I leaned against Shadrach's window, gasping and gulping. My forehead was sweating, but I was relieved that I'd jumped another hurdle. I remembered that I'd not gone downstairs after the nameplates, but decided that after all, there was a good point in it. I lit a cigarette and started walking towards Market Street, trying to translate the interview into number one thinking. Now look here, Mr. Shadrach, there's such a thing as slander. It didn't work. I set up for one. The number one mother said, For God's sake, Billy, why don't you tell the boring little man to stick a job up as Jackson? <laughs>